guys! Welcome back. This week I was kind of straining my brain, kind of trying to figure out what figure to paint for you, so I was kind of rummaging through some boxes of junk and bits and random things looking for an interesting miniature. And I did come up with something that was very, very different and really unlike, really unlike anything I've done before. Uh, and this is what it is. This, it's kind of hard to see because of the reflection. This is a flat miniature. This particular one is of a Roman legionary. He is basically in two dimensions with just some raised relief to show the detail. And he has a front and he has a, ba a clear back to him, but otherwise, you know, it, this is a flat figure. Now, these are used today for wargaming, though it's very niche. There probably are not very many people out there playing games with these, but you certainly could. I don't even know where this figure comes from, to be honest. I just found it in some random stuff. So, you know, if somebody knows the manufacturer, please let me know below in the comments and I will update the description. But, you know, I don't think it really matters that much because I don't expect a lot of you are going to want to be going out and buying a whole army of these guys. Now, these flats have an interesting history. They've been around for a really long time, since the 19th, 18th century. You know, as long as we've been playing with toy soldiers, uh, they, you know, they're nice because they're, they're cheap and economical to produce, easier than a 3D figure. Uh, they take less material. So, you know, they've been toys for a really, really long time. And because they've been around so long, you know, they were around when sort of the beginnings of wargaming came along and they were used for that early on. And, you know, as I said to this day, though, it's, again, much, much less common than it was. Actually, these days, they've kind of developed into their own hobby. There's a whole group of people who collect these, paint these. It's really sort of become its own art form. These are framed, put in displays, and sort of the detail level and quality and sort of sort of variety and range of figures has really improved and in many ways and, and grown from sort of how these started out as simple children's toys but in many ways that's just like the whole kind of model soldier war gaming industry in general it's just this is all but this is really in many ways sort of an apart or apart a, a separate kind of discipline so I'm painting this figure really just as much as a, as kind of a personal experiment as I am to really show you guys what to do because I've always wanted to try one of these. I'm interested in how it works because it really is going to take quite a different range of techniques and a, quite a different approach from what's used on a 3D figure. So this video is kind of going to be a learning experience I think in a lot of ways. Uh, both for me and hopefully for you. Hopefully you'll enjoy seeing how I approach this kind of really very different style of painting. Now my first step here, just like with all figures, is to work on the skin tone. I am using um, a Vallejo brown sand for this, so it's a color that I often use to base coat my skin. You'll notice that the figure is laying on a thin piece of foam, and that is because that base kind of makes it stick out, and I need it to lay flat when I'm painting. I got this bit out of a uh, miniature sprue. There, are, These pieces are often in there sort of as a piece of padding, so it should be easy to find. So not only does it prop the figure up so it lays flat, but it also makes sure that there's a nice soft surface so when you flip the figure back and forth to paint the different sides you're not going to damage your paint work and you can see I work on one color area at a time even if that means kind of turning the figure over so I do all the skin first on both sides and I do the tunic and on both sides etc etc and again just like with normal figures I'm then going to apply a wash to all of the skin areas of Reikland flesh Now to start highlighting. My highlight color here is going to be a mixture of the um, brown sand and some Iraqi sand. And I've got it fairly thinned down so I can apply it nice and transparently and kind of build up layers. Now some of the definition in this figure is very, very fine indeed. So you may find, as I did eventually, that a number zero brush works a little bit better for you. You can do some of this stuff with a number one brush, but you may need to switch, like for painting the fingers and any sort of fine folds and stuff. So you can see that I'm just going to start out here by emphasizing all of the sort of 
areas, the different sort of areas on the skin, so all the muscles and stuff. This is really, you can think about this in a lot the same way as you would a three-dimensional figure. The same areas need to be emphasized, really, like the nose, the cheeks, the forehead, the lips, and chin, you know, it's, it, you're really building up color in the same areas. It's just that you don't have to deal with the round surfaces, which actually makes it in some ways uh, quite a bit easier. Once the first highlight was applied, I switched over to black red here, which I thinned down, and I'm using that to detail all the deep shadows and sort of dividing lines between the flesh and the rest of the figure. So kind of between the fingers, sort of around sort of where it hits the tunic and sleeves, and then of course on the face, I'm putting a lot of deep shadows sort of uh, under his nose, between his lips, under his eyebrows. Kind of, again, very much exactly the same areas that you'd want to focus on if you were painting this in 3D. And again, every time I'm doing this, I'm flipping it over and I'm doing all the same work on both sides of the figure. So sometimes my video will show that and sometimes it won't, but you should just try to completely, you know, apply whatever color you're working on on all sides of the figure just like you would if the figure was in three dimensions. My next highlight now is just pure Iraqi sand thin down and you can see I'm starting to build it up kind of in the same areas that I would if this was a 3D figure again. So you can see on the knees, sort of on the tops of the cat and sides of the calves, uh, just really defining any sort of separate elements of the legs. You can see I'm also sort of applying it along the top of the foot. Now, obviously there's gonna be a lot of straps in those sandals. I'm just right, what I'm doing basically is just painting them right now as if those straps were there, kind of ignoring that, just painting them like he was barefoot. And then later on, we'll go ahead and apply leather straps over the top of it. And that'll just be a lot easier. So you can see, I like with uh, the 3D figures, I'm building up layers of the same color to get you know, more contrast and more sort of different ranges just by working with a single color. You can see how I'm further defining the features of his face, the ones that would uh, be sticking out. That's on a 3D figure, obviously, you can really see which things on the figure stick out more than others and are therefore going to probably be lighter. On a 2D figure, you don't have that. You, things don't stick out physically more into space. So, you know, you ha if it helps, you can almost kind of go and just look at a 3D, a similar 3D figure if you need to get an idea of which areas on the figure would kind of be bulging out more if, if it was a real thing. You're also going to want to sort of pick a light source when you're doing this. I mean, obviously we always pick a light source and usually it's kind of the lights just shining down from the top because that's a little bit more attractive with wargaming figures. But when you're dealing with these guys, it helps to have it be a little bit more uh, specific. You probably want to have it be a little bit more directional. So it's not just coming from the top. It's probably also coming from a specific angle. In this case, the specific angle I ended up choosing was sort of sort of the direction he's facing. So as if the light is sort of shining on him from the kind of the left. So it's coming coming from the top and left. And I'm using that as my guide as I'm applying these really high highlights. This is now a mixture of Iraqi sand and white that I'm putting on. So you can see I'm putting this really high highlight sort of along the left side of the whole figure and then less so on the right side. I'm, I want that to appear darker and more shadow. And that's also gonna make more sense because of course he's carrying that shield on his right side and sort of all the area around there is going to fall into deep shadow. So that's going to all be a lot darker anyway. But I, you can see I'm really using these really light colors to really emphasize an, an extra bright highlight sort of on the left side of his face, of his legs, and all that kind of thing. And again, along the tops of things because so you're, you're going to be thinking sort of as primary, brightest light is coming from the top and then sort of secondarily it's coming from the left. But you could, you could do this however you want it. It's up to you. You could choose to have the light coming from the other direction, like from the right, if you wanted to. But the important thing is just to try to be consistent with your choice. And this is my final high highlight. It's almost pure white and just has a teeny bit of Iraqi sand in it. I'm just doing the same thing 
as before, just even further emphasizing where the really light is really hitting him on the sort of the right sides of his legs and the tops of his feet and face and all of that kind of thing, just building it up. I found with this that I would I would probably applied more highlights uh, or more layers to this maybe than I would have to a 3D figure because with a 3D figure the actual three-dimensional shape of the thing sort of creates its own highlights and shadows to a degree so you don't have to push it as hard but when you're painting this 2D figure you really have to emphasize you know the shapes a lot more using paint you, you know because that's all you've really got so you're gonna you know you're gonna be doing a lot more so it's gonna have to be more exaggerated and you probably need you know to, to go darker on the dark end and you know lighter on the light end and really just exaggerate all the different sort of uh, pieces but the good news is it's much easier to figure out you know where light should be and where you would need to paint and, and because it's only two sided you're also not going to have to worry so much about painting a lot of areas or there's not going to be places that are going to be hard to reach you know like there would be on a 3d figure i'm pretty happy with the skin so now i'm going to go ahead and move on to painting his tunic i'm going to go for the sort of standard classic uh, red color that you see so much on these kind of legionaries. So I'm gonna be base coating sort of all the areas of his tunic here, just using Vallejo Black Red. And then I'm continuing on with the color I usually use to highlight red first, which is uh, Citadel Mephiston Red. And you can see here how I'm applying the first layer along all of the, the sort of front area, the area where light is hitting first. Remember we just talked about that and I'm using it to really emphasize wrinkles and creases in the fabric. And you can see, since I know the sort of that other side is going to be darker, I'm gonna make sure that I apply less paint there and kind of blend it out in that direction. This paint, I thinned it down, but it dries pretty quickly and you can see it's important that you go back over it multiple times really to build it up to sort of its maximum contrast level and that's what you want to do you want to go up until it's not really getting any brighter for you my next uh, color for highlighting the red is going to be evil sun scarlet again from citadel and i'm just doing exactly the same thing except now I'm just applying it a little bit less. It's a, just a really much more bright, intense red. And again, it's pretty transparent, so it'll acquire several layers. And you can see how I'm really focusing on the side of where I've decided that light is hitting the figure and sort of less so. And you can see, again, I'm, I'm, I'm painting always the tops of creases and folds when I'm doing the fabric. Just like when you're working with 3D, you wanna sort of emphasize the tops of wrinkles, even though they're not really 3D here, that the sculpting shows you where there are creases wrinkles so you want to you know run your brightest colors really along the tops of those areas now 3d figures normally unless I'm doing a really good job I would stop highlighting the red at this point because I don't think it needs it but for this I'm gonna push it a little bit further so I've taken some Vallejo beige and mixed it into the evil sun scarlet to get a slightly kind of yellowy red cream color and you can see I'm gonna use that just to highlight the red kind of one click further so and I, you can see I'm really only now applying this to extreme edges and the tops of creases and such and, and keeping it pretty subtle and blending it out because I don't want to just overwhelm and fade out all of the color. Now I'm going to be doing sort of all the sandals, the calgae, and a lot of the sort of straps and belting on this guy. And I'm using um, German camouflage black brown for this. On the sandals, I've got my number zero brush, and I'm just carefully picking out all of the straps where they are. And then he's also got uh, some sort of on his belt, he's got that front piece hanging down. I'm gonna make sure that is base coated in this color. Also, the leather portions of his uh, scabbards for both his dagger and his sword. And then he's just got several or various straps, both holding on the equipment on his uh, sort of traveling pole, and also just the straps, the, his, his baldric straps. So just anywhere there's these leather areas, basically, I'm just making sure to get this good, uh, thorough base coat of the dark brown color. I'm going to be highlighting the leather areas in very much the same way I would, again, if it was a 3D figure. So I first pulled out some Vallejo chocolate brown, and I'm just running that pretty roughly over all the brown areas. I'm not, you know, worrying about being too neat here. I just want to get a little bit 
more of a different tone over top. I'm then gonna move on and mix some beige brown into the chocolate brown, and I'm gonna apply that over top again, sort of lightening it up further as sort of a higher highlight color. And at this point, I'm gonna start being a little bit more careful where I put the paint, especially when you've got those de delicate straps and the sandals. I, I wanna make sure that it stays dark down in the creases and this color really only goes along the tie. But this is still a fairly low highlight on the leather, so it's not too critical if you make a little bit of mess. On, and again, on other areas like the scabbards and any sort of straps up top, again, you wanna make sure these lighter colors are focused towards sort of the, the direction on the figure your light is coming from one and also more towards the top. Um, and then after I've put that, I'm gonna move on to just pure beige brown, doing the same thing, and now just more and more sort of focusing those lighter colors to the direction of the light source, or, uh, sources, top and right in my case. And you know, just carefully building it up. And each time I apply a new layer, I'm making it just more subtle. And then after I put the pure beige brown on, I'm gonna mix some Iraqi sand into that for the next highlight and just keep building it on. And you can see now those straps, particularly the sandals, are really starting to get more defined, more interesting. You can see there's like some real clear highlights, and there's it's much more clear what direction your light is coming from. And so I'm just going to continue this as much as I want. And I, my final highlight on here was really just uh, pure Iraqi sand, but I applied that quite sparingly on just some of the straps I wanted to be really bright. The, the straps, notice up at the very top that are holding some of his packs on, uh, I'm really making sure on those particularly that the lightest colors are really at the very top and they sort of fade downwards. And you may find also that you need to repaint those areas later because you'll get some paint from the other paint and other bits of equipment on it. And that's okay. In reflection, you might find it easier to paint some strapping later. I just tried to do it all at once here, kind of for the sake of expediency. I'm gonna work on a shield cover. Now I'm gonna base coat it here with a mixture of chocolate brown and beige brown. Uh, I found because it was such a big smooth surface that I needed to give this several coats of paint. The first uh, color that I use to highlight this is just pure beige brown. Because we're dealing with a big flat area here, you're gonna to have to blend it out uh, quite a bit. You can see I'm really working again from left to right on here so that you know we get more light hitting the side and less to the sort of the right but nonetheless you're going to have to probably you know still put some of that color on the far right side just because you need to do that to help define the different sort of areas but luckily this is our first highlight layer so it's okay you know if you get more on there and you can see I'm using that same color and I'm really building it up so that I can get several you know different tones on here and I'm making sure that it gets a little just a little bit darker and a little less paint kind of going on to the right side. In order to highlight the shield cover further, I'm now gonna mix some beige into my beige brown. That's very logical as it beige is kind of a yellowish uh, cream color, but it's, it's really very much on the yellow side. And you, I'm doing again the same thing, starting from the left and pulling it to the right. And you can see I'm getting some kind of streaky effects, but in my opinion, and for, particularly for painting this, that's okay because it's this is a leather cover that's stretched over the shield. And it's gonna kind of create some wrinkles, so you can kind of play that up a little bit. And besides focusing on the right side of the shield, I'm also focusing on the top. So you can see I'm putting extra light paint along the top edge and also along the top edge of that little sewn on emblem and along the straps. And there's some sort of sculpted in sort of extra creasing at the corners. And I'm really emphasizing those too with this lighter brown color. I'm just gonna continue doing this on both sides, sort of just building it up carefully until I'm happy with it. And then when I'm done with that, I'm gonna finish up by mixing in even more beige browns, or I'm sorry, more beige into my color. So it's quite a bit more light. And I'm gonna use that as my final highlight. And I'm gonna apply that really pretty sparingly, really along sort of the edges and the top surfaces, almost like an edge highlight, but I, I'm gonna be careful I don't blend that color into the sort of the central or right area too much. It's really just gonna be this fairly, uh, you know, small emphasis. But even though we're not gonna be putting much of it on, it really will help sort of make this shield, you know, really help define and make it stand out. 
Next, I'm gonna work on that pack he's carrying, and uh, I made just sort of a color decision here. This could probably be leather or various things, but I wanted a whiter, kind of creamier color here, just as a nice contrast. But I wanted to be unified with my other colors, so I'm using my final highlight from the shield cover for it, so you can really get a sense of how light that final highlight is. So this is that beige again with a little bit of beige brown mixed into it. I'm just gonna start out by sort of liberally base coating the whole area of that sort of bundle so that you know there's not too much black showing through. My next step here is gonna be highlighting now just using pure beige and you can see I'm using that to emphasize all the lines and sort of folds and creases in the pack. It's pretty subtle right now but this is just a good starting point and then you can kind of continue defining it further by adding some white into your beige to lighten it and then kind of finishing off your final highlights on the pack using pure white. So that's just the kind of the process I went through here, though, as you're gonna see in a minute, I wasn't totally happy with how it turned out, so I sort of had to end up doing a bit of adjustment. I basically felt like the pack was just getting too light and there wasn't enough contrast in it, so I went ahead and applied a sort of a, a fairly light even wash of Sarah from Sepia. Once that had dried and I had some more contrast in the shadow regions, I went back in again and layered on beige and then beige mixed with white and then finally white, kind of going back over just the same areas, but just trying to do a neater job and really trying to make sure that I preserved more areas of shadow and that there was enough contrast. And again, you can see I'm trying to focus the lighter colors towards the top. So I apply the beige and then with the mix of beige and white and just pure white, I always sort of focus those colors towards the tops of the folds and wrinkles and towards the top of the pack specifically because a lot of lights can be hitting it from the top and that's going to get real light so I want to make sure I build up plenty of color in those areas particularly. Now one challenge for me on this figure is there were so many different areas that needed to be brown, but they all needed to be sort of slightly different shades of brown so that everything didn't look like it was made out of the same material. And another brown area that has to be dealt with is the wood. So that means sort of the, 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 the handle and cross on his carrying pole, the, his spear shaft, and sort of some handles and bits on his dagger and sword. I ended up base coating the wood areas first using just pure chocolate brown. And then after I'd done that, in order to get a, a sort of a different uh, tone, I went ahead and mixed khaki into my chocolate brown and I applied that as sort of a first highlight on the wood areas. I'm keeping it pretty thin so that there's a good bit of transparency in there, but the, the idea with the khaki is that it's gonna give a little bit more of a yellowish tone to all the wood areas and therefore, you know, set it apart from the belts and the shield color, which are different shades of leather. And then continued highlighting the wood first using just pure khaki. Uh, to, to lighten it a little bit further. And again, remember you want to keep making sure that lightest color is going along the edge, the side of the figure where the light is coming from, so the top and, you know, you know that side that he's walking towards, in my case. I finished up highlighting by mixing some of my beige into the khaki and using that as a final highlight. And yeah, you, you're probably noticing that some of these colors are similar. And so while I have created a different tone here for the wood, so it looks different from the other uh, brown areas, I am still pulling in some colors that I've used elsewhere. So you get different tones, but you get sort of a consistency and a cohesiveness that way by using sort of bringing in, maybe introducing one kind of new color into your work, but then trying to keep the other colors you work with uh, similar. Again, we've got the mesh, this sort of mesh food bag to paint here. And again, we're dealing with the fact that we need it to be another sort of shade of brown or neutral. Uh, this time I decided that I would base coat the mesh bag using here pure khaki to start with. You can see uh, I flip it before the, the one side is fully had time to dry because I'm in a hurry. In order to keep it from wiping off, I just make sure I hold the figure up slightly while I'm base coating. And then I'm gonna apply a wash of Agrex Earthshade to help deep, uh, sort of darken down in the folds here. 
I'm then gonna start emphasizing the woven nature of the bag. I'm using a number zero brush for this, and I'm starting out with a mixture of the khaki and the beige. There's mostly beige in here, it's quite light. So you can see I'm lightly drawing in the lines and using that sculpting as a guide and just sort of going back and forth here and just really filling that in and you know also making sure again that it's lighter on the side he's walking towards. Uh, I then go ahead and work on highlighting this whole thing. I'm going to do that then by just mixing some white into this color I already have going and I'm going to use that kind of going back over the lines that I just painted but then sort of only applying this lighter color sort of towards the side again that the light is coming from and making sure it sort of fades out into that this darker color on the side that he is sort of not facing towards if that if that makes sense uh, it's okay if you make some mistakes here if you get a mess in down in those cracks you can just go back in later with some say chocolate brown and sort of touch up any areas that you screw up but it is important that you for this kind of work that your paint is good and thin because otherwise it'll be hard to paint these fine you know kind of delicate lines on the figure once that bag was done, I felt like I really needed to emphasize the shadows a bit more that had gotten too light. So I took a kind of a, a fairly um, soft wash of serif and sepia and I applied it to the side of the bag that the light was not coming from. And I just tried to get that on smoothly and sort of evenly. I, I'm not going to show that on camera, but you'll see it in the next step. Now I'm going to start painting all of the steel metal areas on this figure. Now if we were talking about a, a, 2D, a 3D figure here, we could probably just use uh, metallic paints and call it a day. And you could probably use metallic paints on here, but I think it really looks better to do a non-metallic metal sort of uh, approach. And that sounds kind of daunting, but actually I would say if you want to learn non-metallic metal and you want to practice it on a sort of a less challenging subject, a 2D figure like this is a better way to go because you don't have to worry about all the different sides to the figure and the extra planes. You've just got this, these two flat sides, so it's much easier to see where the light should be coming from and where you need to apply the color. So I base coated all of the steel areas using first German gray. And now I'm gonna go back in with a dark blue gray here. And you can see I'm just gonna start sort of emphasizing pretty much all of the you know, individual pieces of metal. So I'm really only leaving the German gray as sort of a dividing line in between the separate elements. Once I've got that color on, um, I'm then going to go back in and lighten that color using some sky gray. And that's where I'm gonna really start working on the highlights. And it's really the same story that we had before with other areas. We want the light to be coming from the top and from the sort of the side that he's walking towards. So you can see, I'm just going to start applying these lighter gray shades, and you can see they're dramatically lighter than the lashes. That's the one trick with a non-metallic metal. You start with some really dark colors, and then you have some really dramatically lighter highlights. So you can see how I'm applying that lighter gray to the side that the light is coming from, and just sort of blending it out from there. But you don't want to blend it out too much, because you need, with non-metallic metals, to have a real stark, sharp, Sharp contrast between the darks and the lights. It shouldn't be a sm necessarily, you don't want as much of a smooth or gradual effect. So with this sort of mi middle gray, I'm picking out the sort of the areas that light would be hitting the figure. And then as you go lighter, it's going to get even more extreme. So once I've got this sort of mix of gray on, I'm then going to go back in with pure uh, sky gray, which is quite a light shade. And you can see I'm then going to really use it to define where light is heading. So you can see along the tops of his shoulders on the plates. And I'm not going to worry about blending it in too much because I want it to look like there's a, a sharp, hard highlight on the metal because that's how reflections on metal work. And so I fill in those areas, you know, that where a lot of light is hitting with the whole light color, but then I then take a really fine line of that light color and sort of also continue it as an edge highlight into the dark areas, because that's also what you'll see with metal that, the sh you know, you're gonna get a big shine where a lot of light is hitting, but then you'll get a really kind of a thin line of that sort of lighter color also continuing as sort of an edge highlight off into the shadows. 
I uh, then just, I'm going to finish up my steel by taking some just pure white. And I'm going to use that very sparingly as an edge highlight, really to make it pop. This is like, this is really a crucial step in painting non-metallic. Now you don't want to apply much white, but where you apply it is really going to, you know, make a huge difference into the whole thing look. So I'm, you know, you're going to apply it in really thin, concentrated lines of along the edges where light is hitting and just along all those sort of top surfaces. And again, don't you don't want to blend it in. You want it to be sharp, crisp. There needs to be sharp definitions between the color areas here more when you're doing non-metallic metal and specifically between the, mo the really bright areas and the dark areas. You may want to blend some of the darker areas together, but when you get up to these brightest highlights, you probably won't want to do any blending at all. You just want them to really sharp, defining lines between sort of the different areas. We're then going to move on to the other non-metallic metal areas on this figure, which are the sort of brass, bronze areas. So that's going to include his sort of belt, the sort of hardware on his uh, dagger and sword, and he's also going to be carrying this pot uh, sort of uh, over his shoulder. I'm going to make that be bronze too. Um, there's sometimes as bronze or brass hardware fittings on the helmets, but on this particular helmet, I didn't really see in any areas that I thought I really wanted to make bronze, so I didn't. But what I did here is I started out by base coating all these areas using German camouflage black brown, so a really, really dark base coat is a good starting point. I'm then going to take a mix of the German camouflage black brown and some Citadel Averland Sunset so I get kind of a brownish yellow color and you can see I'm applying that now um, well like with the belt and all the fittings on the swords and stuff the areas are so small you're really just going to dot on the color and that'll be it. The pot is the only area where you're going to find you're probably going to have to do some more blending work but you can see again I'm uh, applying the color first to the area where light is hitting and then sort of pulling it back into the shadows. This color is a really dark color so it's fine if it covers you know most of the vessel but you can see I'm building up a couple of layers of it on the side where light would be hitting. I'm going to grab pure Averlin Sunset and just do exactly the same thing. You can see how I'm applying it to the lighter side of all the surfaces and then sort of pulling it sort of backwards and on the smaller areas just really dotting it on towards the side where light is coming from is going to be sufficient so that's going to be really really easy to do and on the vase I'm just making sure I blend it back some. Next I'm going to lighten the Averland Sunset with some beige and do the exact same thing. At this point I'm really, I'm going to be a little bit more careful about where I apply the highlights. You can see I'm making my sort of highlights thinner and really applying them sort of along the edges and making sure that we get sort of this really clear side of the vessel where there's light hitting but that, you know, it, it's, it stays, you know, still much more shattered on one side. It's the same thing as when we're painting the steel. We need to make sure our highlights are much more extreme than if this was a non-metallic surface. I'm then going to highlight more using first uh, some white with just a little bit of the beige mixed in to get a really kind of yellow cream color. And that's, and that's going to get sort of the, the main really extreme highlight on these pieces. See how I'm running along the top of the pot handle and around the rim and, you know, really extremely sort of at one side of these uh, pieces. And, you know, and then on the other areas, it's really a, it's still really, again, just a question of dotting the color on the side that light is coming from. And that's it. And you can see, so you're getting one side of these things that's kind of a dark brownish yellow color. And then you've got a really brilliant, almost washed out looking sort of color on the other side. And that's fine. You can see I had to fiddle with it a little bit here. I wasn't happy with the color tone. So I went back in and did some corrections with some of the deeper shades. And just like when you're dealing with steel, you want to finish off with pure white. And that really should only be used as sort of an edge highlight, especially on those tinier areas and on the vessel, really also, again, really as an edge highlight. You don't want to pull it in too far. You want to really just use it as along the extreme edges where the light will be catching that sort of pop. 
Final thing to do here is paint his hair, just because I hadn't done it yet. So I'm just gonna quickly base coat this area first using German camouflage black brown. And then I'm gonna go back in with a mixture of the brown, the chocolate brown and the beige brown and sort of apply that sort of along the individual strands in his hair, just kind of to highlight them and bring them up a little bit. And then I will further highlight them by using the first uh, pure beige um, brown and then finally the beige brown lighten just a little bit with the um, beige itself. Again, these are very similar colors to what uh, we used before in some areas, but I'm gonna be applying them a little bit more subtly here, keeping them darker and not like applying such a high highlight as I did when I used them earlier. So the effect is gonna be a little bit different than it was on the other areas of, of the figure. And again, I just kind of made an arbitrary choice to go with brown here for the hair color because I had a lot of brown paints already mixed on my palette and it's a reasonable shade for a Roman legionary what you kind of think of, but you can easily go with brown or another shade of brown or black or dirty blonde if you kind of feel like it. Okay, so here is our finished uh, sort of Imperial Roman Legionary, uh, kind of Marius's mule type figure with all of his uh, marching kit. This was, I, th I found it to be a fun and sort of interesting subject matter for a figure and as I understand these flats often tend to have more peaceful subjects than the, the 3D ones because they're used more for dioramas and less for wargaming so you, you get a, a more sort of interesting creative range of subjects. Uh, I found painting him to be pretty self-explanatory. I, I guess, you know, all the techniques that I'd used before, you know, prepared me pretty well for this. And I found just translating it onto sort of a 2D figure was really not very difficult at all. I just used the same techniques, but then on, the fl on this, these flat surfaces, and it was, it was probably faster and easier. This figure did take a long time, but a lot of that just came down to sort of the complexity of it, all the different pieces of equipment that had to be covered because there is just a lot going on here. And so, I don't know whether or not you probably won't want to be painting any of these figures yourself, but if you get a chance to pick one up, I might consider giving it a try. I think it's really good practice. It lets you practice some more advanced techniques like the non-metallic metal and you know some blending and stuff and getting the light from the right direction stuff like that on a sort of an easier sort of more straightforward surface than a 3d figure you just have less variables to worry about so it's easier to work on getting those techniques down so i hope you enjoyed this video as usual uh, please like and share it if you did leave me comments and do subscribe to my channel of course if you have not got a chance to do so already so that is all for now and i will see you next week